All right, welcome to Math 340. Um, we are uh, starting in section 1.1 of our textbook, um, 1.1, where we're introducing the concept of limits. Um, limits are actually kind of what, this is an oversimplification, but they're, they're really what all of calculus boils down to, is this one major concept. Uh, you may have heard about some of the other things that we do in calculus, namely derivatives and integrals, and we, sp we spend a whole lot more time dealing with those than we do directly with limits. But it turns out that both of those concepts, derivatives and integrals, which we'll talk about later in the course, are defined in terms of limits. That's really the one thing that makes them what they are. Um, so with that said, uh, we're going to try and, and explain what these things are, and we're going to spend this chapter talking about how to evaluate them, um, taking various different approaches. So we start with the concept of a function. Uh, you should have talked about functions in uh, algebra, um, and uh, they should be something that you're pretty intimately familiar with by this point, because in calculus we're dealing with all these different kinds of functions. But let's suppose that we have some function f of x, and I'm not going to give it any more detail. I'm not going to say it's equal to x squared or anything like that. I'm just going to keep it kind of general. Um, if we have some function f of x, and you want to plug a number into it, let's just say a. We're going to think of a as just some specific real number. Then we use this notation to represent that, f of a. Um, so as an example, if f of x is equal to something like x squared, then if I write f of 3, that means 3 squared, because I put a 3 in for the x, and that gives me a 9. Okay, so this is all old news. There's nothing, uh, nothing surprising about any of this. Um, but where we get into the concept of limits is when you have a function, and you don't necessarily want to know what the value of a function is exactly at some number, but rather, you want to know what the what the function is equal to for values very, 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 very close to a specific number without necessarily equaling that number. Um, it might sound like a, an odd concept, and you might wonder why we would ever need to do that. And we'll we'll talk about why later on. But right now, we just want to get into the the concept. So let's use this graph as sort of an example. In fact, in this section, we're going to be looking at a lot of different graphs of things. So suppose we have some function f of x, and here's a piece of its graph, y equals f of x. Um, we're going to notice there's a curve right here, but then we have a hole in this function right here, and a point way above that hole up here. So in this example, that hole occurs when my x is equal to 2. You can see where the 2 is there. This is telling me that if I were to plug 2 directly into my function, I have to look for where the actual point is, not where the hole is. So the point occurs up here where my y value is equal to 3. That would tell me that f of 2 is equal to 3. But if we flip that around and say, what if instead of plugging 2 directly into our function, what if we're just approaching 2? In other words, what if we're plugging in numbers that are very, very close to 2? What would we get from that? And so to that end, let's, uh, let's think about it. So if I'm plugging in a number like 1 or 1.5 or 1.9 or 1.99 or 1.9999999, those are numbers that are getting closer and closer to 2. Similarly, if I plug in 2.5 or 2.1 or 2.01 or 2.000001, those are x values that are really, really close to 2. And I can follow the curve using those different x values to see what the curve appears to be approaching as we get closer and closer to 2. Well, the curve is approaching this hole. It's not approaching this point. The curve is going towards that hole, and that hole is at 1. So in that case, I would say that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is equal to 1. Now, I realize that was kind of a mouthful. There's a lot that I just said there. But the point is that there is a distinction between what f is actually doing at 2 and what f is uh, doing as we approach 2. So here's kind of that phrase uh, phraseology that I used, but kind of in a more general sense. So if we're looking instead of just the number 2, if I'm looking at any real number a, in the dom uh, whether or not it's in the domain of a function, 
um, if I'm able to plug in x values very, very close to that number a and see where the function seems to be going as we do that, we call that a limit. And I would say that the limit of f of x as x approaches a is whatever that number is. L is what I'm using here to kind of be general. In this case, the a would have been 2 and the l would have been 1. Okay. Now, that's how we would read it, but here's the actual notation for that. L-I-M, which stands for limit. And you, you see this x with an arrow pointing towards the a. So the way that we read this is the limit as x approaches a of f of x, so the f of x is to the right of this notation, equals whatever that, that number is, l. Okay? So again, the idea is that the limit does not actually have to be uh, the same number that the function actually is equal to at that point is just what it's approaching. All right. And again, I mentioned this before, but we're not going to worry about why we would care about this quite yet. We just want to get used to the concept and then we can start looking at how it's applied. So let's use uh, this example here where I have this graph to try and evaluate some limits and some various different things. So <clears throat> Here, uh, it, let's go over the instructions really quick. Estimate the following limits and function values using the graph of y equals f of x shown here. If the limit does not exist, we write DNE. That just stands for does not exist. Okay, so looking at what we have here, the first thing I'm asked to evaluate is the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x. So I'm going to find 4 on my x-axis. It's here. And I'm going to see where that coincides with my graph. Um, it looks like as far as what we can see in this picture, f doesn't take on any value when x is equal to 4. Because I have this hole here, but I don't have any other points that would correspond to what f is equal to there. So that's okay because limits don't actually need the function to be defined there. They just need to be defined arbitrarily close to that value. So if I look at what happens when x is approaching 4 from either direction, from the left or from the right, um, then my uh, curve is approaching this hole right here. So where is that hole? Well, it looks like it's at 4 on the y-axis. That would mean that the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x is actually equal to 4. Now, it's a coincidence that there's a 4 here and a 4 here because these are two different these are coming from two different places. This, this 4 here is an x value, whereas this 4 corresponded to a y value. So don't, get, don't read too much into the fact that these numbers are the same. That's not really anything important. Um, let's look at another one. What is the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x? So now let's find 2. Here's 2 on my x-axis. What is happening as x gets really close to 2? And remember, there is two di there's two different directions you can approach this number 2 on the x-axis. You can approach from the left, where you're using numbers smaller than 2, or you can approach from the right, where you're using numbers larger than 2. And in this case, I actually see two different types of behavior happening, depending on which direction I'm coming from. So if I approach 2 from the left, coming from this direction here, Looking at the points corresponding to these x values on my curve up here, I'm approaching this point right here, which based on uh, the scale that I'm using for my y-axis, that looks like that would be 3 right there. But if I approach from the other direction, if I approach 2 from the right, and I look at those points on my curve that correspond to those x values, the curve is going somewhere else from this direction. It's going down to this hole, which appears to be it when y is equal to 1. So in one direction, I get a 3. In the other direction, I get a 1. In this case, I would say that, that limit does not exist. And that's a really, really important thing to uh, get your head around, which is that if a limit of a function as x approaches some number is going to exist at all, then it has to, your function has to be approaching that number regardless of which direction you're coming from, whether from the left or from the right. Okay, um, We'll get into the concept of what we call one-sided limits, which uh, go into a little bit more detail on that. Uh, and we'll do that in just a little bit. But let's do these other two par uh, parts of this problem. What is f of 4? Notice there's no limit here. So in this case, I'm not interested in what my curve is approaching or what my function is approaching as x approaches 4. I want to know what the function is actually equal to exactly when x is equal to 4. So I'm going to come over here. x is equal to 4 right here. And when I plug 4 into my function, 
I get no point anywhere. And remember, we acknowledged that at the beginning of this uh, example. So because I'm not seeing any point on my curve, or off my curve for that matter, where uh, x is equal to 4, I would say that this one also does not exist. The function is just not defined there, it appears. Finally, f of 2. What is f of 2? Well, if I plug 2 into my function, there's two parts of my curve that seem to correspond to that, but only one of them has an actual point there. The other one is a hole. So when I plug 2 into my function, I find the point corresponding to that, which is here. And that gives me a y value of 3. So that tells me that f of 2 is equal to 3. Okay. Notice we dealt with the numbers 2 and 4 in two different ways both with a limit and with an actual function value. And we got different things when we, when we approach these in different ways like that. All right, so let's talk about one-sided limits. Kind of like I was saying before, if you want to evaluate the limit of a function um, as x is approaching some number, you have to consider what's happening from both directions. But sometimes we may not need to do that. Maybe, maybe it's enough to just approach a number from only one of those two directions. And we call that a one-sided limit. So for example, if I want to be approaching uh, 2 from the left, I would only be following the curve from this direction. I wouldn't be going from this direction because all of the x values that are less than 2 are the ones that I'm using to approach from the left. So that's what we're talking about right here. We're only using numbers smaller than some value a to approach a. And in that case, we would say the limit as f of x uh, the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left is L, whatever L happens to be. This is the notation for it. Compare it to the notation for a regular limit that we've already talked about. The limit as x approaches a from the left, we put this little minus sign up here um, in, the, uh, in the exponent, or the superscript is the more technical term for that. Um, it's not an exponent, it's just notation. The minus there is not to indicate that something is negative. It doesn't actually mean that anything is necessarily negative. It just means that we're approaching using numbers that are smaller than a. So this is the notation for a, a limit from the left. Similarly, we could talk about a one-sided limit that approaches um, some number a but from the right instead of the left, in which case we're using numbers that are larger than a but getting closer and closer to a to see what that one-sided limit is. The notation is really similar, but where we had a minus before, we're going to have a plus. And again, that plus is not does not mean anything being positive. It's not referring to something being positive at all. It just means that we're approaching a using numbers that are larger than a. Okay? Now, um, because we have these things called one-sided limits, it kind of makes sense that the thing that we talked about before this, which is just the limit, can also sometimes be called a two-sided limit. So this is like a term that I'm going to use interchangeably with just the word limit. Um, but it's, it's meant to indicate that we're approaching from both the left and from the right. And now we have this, this kind of, you can call this a theorem if you want. Um, so we now know that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to L if and only if the limit as x approaches a both from the left and from the right are equal to each other and also equal to that same number L. So this is kind of a mathematical way of communicating what we've been saying over and over, which is that a two-sided limit only exists and is equal to some number L if both of these one-sided limits also both exist and are equal to that same number L. Okay? Let's check another example. This one has a lot of different uh, parts to it. So in this function here, we want to estimate a few limits. Um, some of them are one-sided limits. Um, I think uh, some of them are also two-sided limits, and we're just going to see how we approach those different, those different uh, types. So let's start with A. We want to take this graph of this function and use it to estimate the limit as x goes to negative 4 from the right. Remember, that's what that plus means. So I'm going to start by finding negative 4 on my x-axis, which is here. And then from the right means I use numbers that are larger or to the right of negative 4 on the x-axis to approach negative 4. So I'm going to jump a little bit to the right and see where do I have points on my curve corresponding to those x values. Well, that would be down here. And now I want to approach negative 4 and see where that curve appears to be going. It's approaching that hole right there, and that hole appears 
to have a y coordinate of negative 2. So I would say that this one appears to be negative 2. Okay, let's try approaching negative 4 again, but this time from the left. So here's negative 4. From the left would mean I'm coming from this direction and approaching negative 4 that way. Those values correspond to this little segment of our curve. So I'm now going to follow this curve until I get to a, a point that has an x value of negative 4, and it takes me here to this point. That's where this appears to be going. Um, this has a y value of 3. So that would mean that as I approach from the left, I get a limit of 3. Part C, we're still approaching negative 4, like we did in the previous two parts, but this time it's a two-sided limit, and I can tell because there's neither a plus nor a minus in the superscript for that number. Don't get confused by the minus here. This is literally part of the number. That's negative 4. But I would have to have a plus or a minus up here to indicate that we're looking at a one-sided limit. So in order for this limit to exist, my function has to be approaching the same thing whether I approach from the left or from the right. But we've already looked at what's happening as we approach negative 4 from the left and from the right. And we got two different numbers. So the fact that these disagree with each other means that this limit does not exist. Okay? Let's try it with another number. So this time I want to approach negative 1. And notice I'm kind of following the same pattern. This problem here is a right-sided or a right-handed limit. I'm approaching from the right. This is a left-handed limit. I'm approaching from the left. And this is a two-sided limit. And all three of these are all approaching the number negative 1. So let's find negative 1. Negative 1 is here. Okay. If I approach from the left, I'm going to be following this curve from this direction. And it appears to be taking me to this point where I get a 4. So, well, I, look, I approach from the left, which is actually this problem. So let's just do part E first, I guess. I was approaching a 4 there. All right, I've been doing it this way. Go like that. Okay, what if I approach from the right? Well, to the right of negative 1 means I'm using this part of the curve. But this part of the curve, as I approach negative 1, is also approaching that same point. It's approaching 4. So I would have gotten a 4 here as well. Okay, now I don't even need to look at my graph because I can evaluate this limit using the information that I got from these two one-sided limits. They both approached 4, which means this has to also approach 4. Okay, and that's what that sentence at the end of the last page was talking about. This limit exists and is equal to 4 if and only if both of these limits exist and are equal to 4. One last problem we're going to do this with, we're going to have x approach positive 4 this time. First from the right, then from the left, and then the two-sided limit. So where is positive 4? Well, it's right here. Okay, so when I look at my graph, I can see that uh, as x approaches 4 from the positive direction or from the right, we're coming from here, and we're approaching that hole, which is at 2. But then I see if I approach from the left, the same thing is happening. I would be coming from this direction instead of from down here. And I'm still approaching that hole as x gets closer and closer to 4. So in both cases, our function is approaching whatever the y-coordinate of that hole is, which appears to be 2. So I would say that that one-sided limit is 2, and that one-sided limit is also 2. And because these agree with each other, then that automatically tells me that the two-sided limit is the same thing. It's also 2. Okay? All right. So what we've been doing this whole time is evaluating limits, but using what's called the graphical approach. So that's where we have a graph like this one, where we can kind of follow the curve from different directions as x approaches whatever number we're approaching, and kind of see visually where the function appears to be going. There are some problems with that approach. Um, one problem that we have with that approach is you can't always trust your eyes with a graph. Um, we wrote down these values here, but notice that the problem didn't say evaluate the limits, it said estimate the limits. And the reason for that is because, take, take this first one for example, I said that as the limit as x approaches negative 4 from the right was equal to negative 2. Uh, I did that because that's where this hole appears to be, at negative 2. But what if I'm not seeing that exactly right? What if it's actually like negative 1.995 or something like that? That's so close to negative 2 that it would be hard to really see the difference between those two positions. 
So you have to kind of trust your eyes if you're doing a, a, graph, a graphical approach to evaluating or estimating a limit. Um, not only that, some functions, uh, some of the functions you might be dealing with, you may not even have a graph to look at. Um, sometimes we have limited information about a function, like we may only know a finite number of points on that function, and we may not have curves that we can graph out and follow them. So the graphical approach is, is a, a decent one when a graph is available, but there's other approaches that can give us a little bit more accuracy. So I'm going to introduce the next approach, and then in the next video, we'll start looking at some examples. Um, so let's talk about it here. Uh, I mentioned that there's some this is uh, there's some issues uh, using the graphical approach. That's what we just talked about. What we're going to do next is use a technique called the numerical approach, and this is actually pretty straightforward. What we're doing, if we're trying to evaluate the limit as x approaches a. For some of some function f of x, um, what we're going to do is plug in numbers, values that are very, very close to a, both from the left and from the right, and put those numbers into a table, and then look for a pattern. Now let's see if those numbers are appear to be approaching anything specific. Once we've done that, we can make a good estimate as to what that limit is equal to. So um, I'm going to end this video here just for the time, but uh, starting in part two, we're going to look at an example of how to do that.